right, Luke chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturias, and uh, the region of uh, Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the word of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also the publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed to you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, what, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, and all men used in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. Now baptism is a uh, very misunderstood act. It is commanded for every believer to be baptized, but there's much disagreement on why one is baptized. What is the point? What is the purpose of baptism? There is, in fact, a school of thought, and I'll be talking a little about them today, that believes and teaches that baptism is required because it is at the point of baptism when one is born again. And we're going to look at a couple of verses that they used to justify this, and then we're going to look at some verses that directly and clearly oppose that view, and we'll try to make sense of it. So here we see the first mention of baptism in the Bible is with John the Baptist. Now I know you might be saying, well, what about Matthew? Isn't that the first of all? It's all the same, it's the same thing. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all talk about baptism. And, uh, but the first time we ever see the mention of baptism in the Bible is with John the Baptist. But we should know that baptism did not originate with John the Baptist. In fact, uh, when we see the Jews and the Pharisees questioning John about his baptism, they clearly were not questioning him about what he was doing. You know, what, what is this thing? Why are, you, why are you dunking people in the water? The only thing they questioned him about is what, by what authority he baptized. They understood what baptism was because the Jewish people had practiced the form of baptism for a long time before this. Um, so long before John came about, baptism, or mikvah it is called in Hebrew, was practiced in the Jewish culture. Mikvah was one of three final acts that was done by a Gentile convert to Judaism. The first was circumcision, then the mikvah ceremony, and that was done by taval, or by immersion, the same way that we do it. And that symbolized ceremonial sanctification unto God. They were being set aside as gods. I mean, as God's property, not they were made gods. I'm saying they were, as they were given to God. And finally, they were to give a burnt offering, burnt sacrifice. 
However, since there is no temple now, the burnt sacrifice part has been set aside until such time as there is a temple. Now, there is a uh, highly regarded 12th century Jewish scholar by the name of, of, of Maimonides. I'm not sure I'm saying that word right, but no word for now. And he said this. He said, by three things did Israel enter into the covenant, by circumcision and baptism and sacrifice. Circumcision was in Egypt, as it is written, no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof, in Exodus 12, 48. Baptism was in the wilderness, just before the giving of the law, as it is written, sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, that's Exodus 19, 10. And sacrifice, as it is said, and he sent young men of the children of Israel, which he offered burnt offerings, Exodus 24, 5. When a Gentile is willing to enter the covenant, he must be circumcised and be baptized and bring up a sacrifice. And at this time, when there is no sacrifice, they must be circumcised and be baptized. And when the temple shall be built, they are to bring a sacrifice. The Gentile that is made a proselyte and the slave that is made free, behold, he is like a child newborn. So the Jews were no strangers to baptism, to what John was doing. Now, while Maimonides... Uh, uh, lived after the time of John, yet he was a scholar that was basically quoting the people from even before the time of Christ who, were there, uh, who practiced this. The big difference was that John's baptism, as we read here in verse 3, was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Baptism was of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, this is one of the first verses that... Uh, these people who believe in baptism bringing salvation, this is one of those verses that they use to justify that. They say, look, it was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And they say, what happens to salvation? Well, your sins are remitted. And that's true. But is that what this is actually saying? Is it the same thing? We'll get back to that. I promise we will discuss it. What I first want to look at here is the repentance part. It was a baptism of repentance. This is vital to understand about baptism. Repentance is always an aspect of baptism. Quite often when we read about someone being baptized in Scripture, repentance is a part of it. It's either it's mentioned in conjunction with baptism, it's told that it's an, it's an act of repentance, um, and here we see John explaining repentance to the people. He's actually giving them a laid out explanation of what he means by repentance. And, and, they, and, and in this case, there's an actual physical expectation that he expects as well. There's a repentance of the heart and a repentance of action. Uh, it says in verse, uh, in verse 10, the people ask him, what shall we do? You know, what do you mean by repentance? What, what are we supposed to do? So he answered and said, he that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none, he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Okay, if you have, if somebody is in need and you are able to help them, help them. Simple. They came the publicans. These are the, these are the collectors of tribute for, for uh, the Romans. They said, what shall we do? And they probably figured he was going to say, stop working for the Romans. But that's not what he said. All he said was, exact no more than that which is appointed to you. Or in other words, don't take from anybody more than what is expected from them. Okay, this is the amount that they're to pay for tribute. You know, two shillings, whatever it might be. Um, a denarius, uh, I don't know, whatever they were using at the time. Um, don't say uh, five denarius, and then keep four for yourself, and give one to the Romans. That's what, they, that's what the publicans did. The publicans made themselves very, very rich, just ex demanding as much as they wanted, and pocketing the excess, and give to the Romans what they were expected to do. So he said, only take that which is appointed. Don't cheat the people. The soldiers asked, what shall we do? He said, do, no, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. So, now obviously soldiers do violence to people. That's kind of their job. But what he's talking about here is, is, is unnecessarily. You know, a soldier is meant to go to battle, not to beat up on people in the street just because they're in the way. Um, apparently that's what some of them were doing. They were just being bullies to people. And he said, uh, 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 neither accuse any falsely. Apparently they were lying about people. Maybe so they could beat them up. I don't know. 
uh, and be content with your wages. They were probably stealing from people, using their power and their authority as soldiers to take away from other people. So, uh, so time and again, these people came and said, what do we do? And he told them, change this in your life. You know? And he wasn't telling them to do anything remarkable, just be decent, honest people. That's all he was telling them to do. And of course, in verse, uh, in verse 9, he says, Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. So produce good fruit in your life. Live as one who has repented unto God. So, repentance. They were to repent. That was the whole aspect of John's baptism. It was in that baptism of repentance. Now look over at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And as you're going, let me give you a little bit of background because I don't want to read everything because just for the lack of, just for the uh, sake of time. But uh, here this is the day of Pentecost. And uh, Peter and the apostles have preached to the thousands of people here who were in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. And when the people who were there and listening, uh, some of them were convicted by what they had heard and they believed what Peter was saying. But they didn't know what to do with this information. So in verse, uh, uh, verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, which is what Peter had just preached unto them about Christ, they were pricked in their heart, that means they were convicted by the Spirit, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized all of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, here is another of the proof texts for those who say that baptism is when you get saved. They say, look, see, get baptized for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the Holy Ghost. There it is. You get baptized so that your sins can be remitted, and then you receive the Holy Ghost. That's what they'll tell you. Again, I'm going to get back to that, but that's not the main thing I want to look at right now. The main thing I want to look at first off is what's the first thing he tells him in verse 38. Repent. Repent and be baptized. So here again we see that connection between repentance and baptism. Uh, he says, repent. Turn your hearts from your way to God's way. Turn from sin to Christ. That's what repent means. It means to turn around and go the other way from the way you're going. The initial act of repentance is out of the heart unto salvation. Works don't save us. Repenting and changing your actions doesn't save you. That's a part of being saved. Repentance of the heart is an understanding that you've been made new in Christ and you're no longer supposed to live as that old person. You're now supposed to live as a new person to Christ. That's what repentance is. And then the act of repentance of changes in your life will follow salvation. So, uh, what we see here is the people here, they believe, and I believe at that point where they say, what should we do? I believe that's when they were actually saved, because they believed in what, what, what Peter was telling them. So Peter tells them, repent, you know, repent, change your heart, and, and get baptized for the remission of sin. Why? Because your sins have been remitted. It's not to get your sins remitted, it's because your sins have been remitted. Now I want to speak on a moment again on the idea that salvation occurs in baptism. We've seen twice now about baptism seeming to confer salvation or remission of sins. And while I don't believe this is what, and I, I, this is why I don't believe it, uh, it happens that way. The first time that we mentioned it was in John's baptism. That could not refer to forgiveness to eternal life. Does anybody have any idea why? Why could John's baptism not give eternal life? There's one very specific reason. It's not a trick question. Anybody? Gideon? Christ hasn't died yet. Because Jesus hadn't died yet. 
We are born again by faith in Christ and what He did on the cross, right? That's how we're saved. We have, must have the blood of Christ shed at Calvary applied to our sins, and thus His righteousness is applied over our unrighteousness. That's how we're saved. When John was preaching, Christ hadn't died. So that remission of sin could not be eternal life. So what was it? What was the remission of sin? Well, I'm not 100% sure. It could be probably two different things. One, it was either a temporary forgiveness for your sins at that moment, which before Christ died, you could ask for forgiveness of sin, and usually you had to give a sacrifice as well. But as soon as you sinned again, you had to do it again. That one sin was forgiven, but as soon as you sinned again, psh, you were, you were good. that was it. You had to be forgiven again. It was a continual offering of sacrifices and work to keep the law in order to try to stay forgiven. And nobody could be forgiven fully there. That's why Christ had to die. If anybody could have been saved through John's baptism, then Christ would not have had to die because then everybody could just get saved and have their sins remitted then. Um, so, so it was either that or it was, a, it was a forgiveness of sins that looked forward to when Christ would die and our sins would be forgiven, would be fully remitted. But it could not be salvation at John's baptism. Now what about Acts chapter 2? It seems pretty clear. Okay, this is after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So why couldn't it be that? Well, uh, remember the faith which they clearly already have is what saves. They had faith when they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? The faith was already there. They just didn't know what to do with it. So Peter said, repent. Okay, get your heart right before God. Understand you're a new creature. Change your ways. Change your direction in your heart. And then be baptized because your sins have been remitted. And you're going to receive the Holy Ghost. Now, we have to understand that what, what, when Peter says this, he is not giving a pathway to salvation. Step one, step two, step three, boom, now you're saved. That's not what he's giving. He's giving just a general overview. They already believe. Okay? Repent. Get baptized. Receive the Holy Ghost. All these things are going to happen right now. It's not a, a, a map. It's, it's, it's a... It's a Concurrent activity of what's happening right then. But again, repentance and baptism are very closely related there. Now, uh, I want to show you one more thing here that will prove very clearly that, that, that this could not have been the case. Uh, and uh, one other thing I want to point out, at the time of, of Pentecost, and for a little while after that, the receiving of the, of the Holy Ghost was not the way it happens today. And there was a reason for it. At the time, oftentimes when the Holy Ghost was given, right at the beginning of the church time, right, at, right here in the beginning of Acts, the Holy Ghost did not always come directly on that person at the time of salvation, which is what happens today. What would happen is that the, is that the, the apostles would lay their hands on people and they would receive the Holy Ghost. Now, why did it happen that way? This was not the pattern for all time. It happened then in order to show the authority that God had given to the apostles and to this new movement of the church. It was not something that was going to go on all the time. And we can see because very clearly shortly after this, people are receiving the Holy Ghost without the laying on of hands. But in, uh, in Acts chapter 8, uh, if we remember Simon the, uh, Simon the sorcerer, who he, he believed and got baptized and followed after the apostles, and he saw them laying hands on people and then receiving the Holy Ghost. And he wanted to be able to do that. Now that's not a bad thing. He wanted to do it. It wasn't his job. And he didn't understand how to receive that power. And so he tried to buy it. And of course the reason he did that wasn't because he was lost, as some people say. It was because he had spent his life as a sorcerer. How do sorcerers get their power? They buy it. They purchase spells. They purchase talisman. They purchase uh, uh, power words and things of that sort. Am I not right? Yeah. Wife who used to be in the New Age knows some of these things. 
you spend money to advance in magic. He was a brand new Christian. He didn't know any better yet. So he just did what he'd always done. Hey, I give you this, you give me the power to do that. He wanted it for a good reason. Now Peter slapped him down real quick for it, with, with, made no, in no uncertain terms, told him just how wicked it was that he did that. And he asked for forgiveness, which is a good thing. That's why I believe he was saved. But um, the point is that they were laying hands on people and they were receiving the Holy Ghost. But now look over at Acts chapter 10, just two chapters after that. Acts chapter 10. Now again, I'm not going to read the whole thing for the sake of time, but this is the incident of the Roman centurion named Cornelius. And Cornelius, a Gentile, excuse me, I'm wrong, uh, loved the Lord, did not really fully know him yet, but he loved him, and so uh, the Lord sent an angel in a vision to speak to Cornelius and told him, send to Joppa, and uh, for one day, Peter, He's abiding at the house of uh, Simon the Tanner. And have him come. And when he comes, he'll tell you what you need to know. So Cornelius sends. And just before Cornelius' messengers arrive, Peter has a vision as well. And most of us are familiar with his vision. It's a vision of the sheep coming down from heaven, held by four corners. Men the sheep are all manner of four-footed beasts and animals and bugs and crawling things and so forth. And, uh, uh, and, and the Lord says to Peter, Peter, rise, kill and eat. Now, understanding, within this, within this sheet of animals were a bunch of animals that were considered unclean to the Jews. But the Lord says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, not so, Lord, because I've never eaten anything unclean. And he says, don't you call unclean what I have cleansed. So, this happens three more times. And then the vision ends, the sheep goes back up into heaven, and he comes to himself. And then, about that same time, comes a messenger from Cornelius. And as the messenger is there, the, the Spirit tells, tells Peter, go with him, don't question anything, just go, and you'll know what to do. So Peter goes with the messengers, goes to Cornelius' house. When he gets there, Cornelius has a, a whole house full of people there. And they're just sitting with their hands folded, waiting, saying, Okay, Pete, what you got for us? I mean, there was no, there was no you know, explanation or anything. He just came, and, uh, uh, well, Cornelius told him about his, uh, his, his vision, and that he was told to come. And he said, uh, in verse 33, Immediately, therefore, I said to thee, and thou hast well done, to thou art come. Now, therefore, we are all here present before God, to hear all the things that are commanded thee of God. Peter, tell us what God wants you to tell us. And Peter's like, I didn't have time to study for a sermon. Come on. No, Peter speaks. Peter speaks. Verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea, began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, who they slew and hanged on a tree, and God raised him up the third day and showed him openly. Now right there at 39 and 40, what did he give him? He gave him the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's important to remember. He gave him the gospel. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whomsoever shall believe in him shall receive remission of sins. So now he has preached to them about Christ. But he's not done talking. But the Lord's done. The Lord's done with him. 
The Lord wants him to finish now. So the Lord does something. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. So when, heard, when the Holy Ghost fell on them, what happened? What was that? What does that mean? Come on, it's not hard. No trick question. <laughs> they got saved. They got saved. Thank you. They got saved.
He brings to our remembrance things that we have heard that we need to know when we need to know them. Um, he comforts us and strengthens us to do the work of God. So there's a lot that the Holy Spirit does. And one of the things that he has called is he has called the earnest of our inheritance. Now what does that mean? An earnest of inheritance means that he is the token that was given to us that proves to us that we are going to receive an inheritance of God. A picture of that would be a, uh, a, uh, an engagement ring. You give an engagement ring as an earnest to the, to the bride-to-be that you are, it's a promise made that you are going to marry her. It's, a, it's the beginning of a covenant. It's kind of the, the, the opening part of the covenant. It's an exchange of a gift. And that gift means, I'm going to marry you. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit is. He is the promise given to us, the token, that we are going to be fully redeemed by Christ and we have eternal life. So the Holy Spirit would not come upon these people in Acts chapter 10 mm -hmm. if they weren't saved. So, as I said, the reason I feel that I wasn't as faithful as I should have been in this baptism, or really in a lot of it that I've done here, and uh, one of the things about being a pastor is that you're always learning. And sometimes you learn things that kind of have to uh, push away things that you've taught in the past, and then you've got to try to fix that because you did something wrong before. This is one of those cases. Um, the biblical example that we are given of baptism is baptism happens immediately after salvation. They believe, they get saved, they get baptized. It's not you believe, you get saved, you give them six months to make sure they're a good person and saved, and then you baptize them. You get saved and baptized. It happened on Pentecost. It happens every time we see baptism mentioned, it is always mentioned immediately after salvation. We see when uh, in Acts chapter 8, when Philip is, is sent by the Holy Ghost, to go out into the wilderness and meet up with an Ethiopian eunuch who had been in, at Pentecost for the feast. And uh, he had been there worshiping, so apparently he was a convert to Judaism himself. Um, now this Ethiopian eunuch was an important man in the Ethiopian court. He was the keeper of the queen's uh, treasury. And uh, so when Philip joins him, he preaches Christ to him. And as he's preaching, as they're going along, because he's riding his chariot, they come to a small body of water. And now we don't know what the conversation has been other than Philip's been preaching, preaching Christ to him from the Old Testament to, to current. And as they get to this water, the, the eunuch stops and says, look, here's water. What, what, what forbids me from being, or what keeps me from being baptized? Okay, uh, what does hinder me from being baptized? Now we don't know that, that Philip ever even talked about baptism, but the eunuch knew he had to be baptized. So, uh, uh, so Philip says, uh, all that Philip says is, uh, if thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. He didn't tell him what to believe, he just said, if you believe. So then the Ethiopian eunuch says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of John. And that was sufficient for Philip. And I want you to notice something interesting. We don't see the Bible say, the Holy Ghost came upon him and he spoke in tongues. There doesn't seem to be any sign outwardly that anything happened, except that he believes. And that was sufficient for Phillips. And he knew he had to get baptized. He wanted to be baptized. So Philip says, okay, you believe? Let's baptize him. He got in the water, put him down in the water, and before he could bring him back up, the Bible says the Holy Spirit took Philip and, 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 and took him away somewhere else. Which must have been really weird for the eunuch comes up and Philip's gone. <laughs> you down there? You down there? But the Bible says he went away rejoicing. He was born again. And he got to see a really cool miracle at the same time. Uh, uh, when uh, the jailer who, who uh, uh, was uh, preached to by Paul and Silas, after Paul and Silas had been in prison, uh, he gets saved and he's immediately baptized. Simon the sorcerer believed and he was baptized. Time and again, we see that is the biblical example. Salvation, baptism, right away. Baptism is not an act of salvation, or an act unto salvation. It is an act of salvation. It is the first act of obedience. It is the act that is associated with the repentance of the heart. It is a, it is, what it's doing is it's confirming in your flesh what just happened in your spirit. 
And if you wait too long between the two, you, you kind of miss the connection. So I've done a great disservice, not just to Brandy, but to others as well, who I kind of waited a while before they were baptized, because that is the time of repentance. And I believe that's why we see in the Bible that people repented and then followed God, just got excited and followed the Lord and followed the apostles and followed the doctrine, because they had that confirmation both in spirit and in flesh. And when we miss part of it, it causes a problem. The point of baptism is that it's a line crossed. It's a line of repentance. It says, after this, I understand I am a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, from this moment on, all things are new. Not just my spirit, but my life is going to be a new life. I'm going to go a new way, a new direction. It's at this point that we leave behind the old life and start the new life. When Jesus got baptized, up until that point, as far as we know, he had shown no real signs, for the most part, that he was going to be the Messiah. He was probably, I believe he was a carpenter, if he followed in his, in, in his earthly father's footsteps, his stepfather's footsteps. Um, he was a teacher in the, in the temple, obviously, everybody called him rabbi. Um, they said that he, it was his normal activity he would get up and, and read in the, in, in, the syn in the synagogue. So, uh, but there wasn't really anything about his life that showed he was going to be the Messiah. But when he came and he got baptized, from that moment on, his entire life direction changed. He stopped being a carpenter, put down the tools, left the synagogue for the most part, though he did go back and declare himself to be the Messiah in the synagogue. Uh, but everything about his life totally changed 180 degrees in the direction he went. Now he was the Messiah. Now he was the Son of God. Now he was performing miracles. Now he was teaching people about the coming kingdom of Christ. Everything changed after the baptism. And that's what baptism is supposed to be. And that's why I'm explaining it. It doesn't save us. It confirms it to us. Both to the one baptized as well as to the one as well as to those who witness. So this morning, as we we're bapt, as I as, as I baptized Brandy, I preach this as a reminder to her, as well as to all of us who have been saved and baptized, that from the point of baptism we should live that new life. Baptism is associated with repentance, and so let us all seek to live a new life in Christ, as we ought to do, because we have been baptized into Christ. Brandy, are you, you need to change or anything, or are you ready? I'm going to get my shoes up, so. Okay. Let me uh, get this out of here. Get the thing that might shoot that'll shock me out? Yeah, we'll get that out. <laughs> I didn't know where we were going. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get in your way. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, no, don't kneel. Otherwise, I'm going to break your knees. And 
of squat to the squat. Fortunately, you're short, so it shouldn't be difficult. Yeah. I'll try not to laugh at the back. <laughs> well, luckily I'm hard-headed. <laughs> Billy knows. <laughs> okay. Brandy, have you accepted Christ by faith as your Savior? Yes. Okay. Then uh, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of Jesus' death. Raised again as a picture of his glorious resurrection. From this day to live for Christ, a new creature. Amen.